सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक्तु सह वीर्यम करवा वहे तेजस्विना वदीतमस्तु महाविद्विषा वहे ओम शांति 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 गुरुर् ब्रह्मा गुरुर् विष्णु गुरुर् देवो महेश्वर गुरुदेव परम ब्रह्म तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः वसुदेव वसुतम देवम कंस चानूर मर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगत गुरुम वक्तुं सुबोध वेदांतम प्रवृत्तो शबुदोप्यहम कृपया यस्य तम वंदे श्री गणेशम पुनः पुनः वंदे सरस्वतीं देवीं सद्गुरुं मे महामतिं सीता समेत श्री रामम यच्चं सुशुभधाम मतिं लास्ट वीक्स so last week's verses that we had seen are verses on the guru so we had seen qualities of the guru and here are the different qualities shrotriyam learned in the shastra and following the tradition brahmanishtaha established in the truth naiva kamataha free of all addictions and they all who compassionate deshika a teacher daksha skilled and shishya prashna nivaraka one who can remove the doubts of the student okay so these were the lakshanas of the guru now I don't know. We'll chat verse seven and eight, and I'll conclude that thought. Ah, huh? today you can repeat after me. I am to Bahava Shisha. I am to Bahava Shisha. Viratascha Mumukshavaha. Viratascha Mumukshavaha. Eva Mitchan Pratik Sheta. Eva Mitchan Pratik Sheta. Guru Shreshta Sasarvada. Guru Shreshta Sasarvada. Ekame Vaguro Karium. Ekame Vaguro Karium. Shisha Namsyat Krasartata. Shisha Namsyat Krasartata. Guru Swat Manititwaste. Guru Swat Manistitwaste. Sarva Bhuta Hiterataha. Sarva Bhuta Hiterataha. Here, this is what the Guru seeks. The Guru then says, May many disciples who are dispassionate and are seekers of liberation come to me. Desiring this, the great Guru always waits for such disciples. The Guru has only one duty. The fulfillment of liberation of his students. Establish in his own self, he remains engaged in the welfare of all beings. Okay. So we saw the Lakshana's qualities of a teacher. And with that, there's a very subtle point to add is that as much as we look at these various qualities actually the shisha is never really in a position to examine the guru see in in any situation who is the examiner and who is the examined the examiner always has to be one who knows more than the examined Huh? The supervisor, the test must know more than the student. Yeah. So it's very interesting when we see these qualities of a teacher. Does it mean that student can now examine the teacher? No, it doesn't mean student can examine the teacher because the student is not in a position to examine the teacher. You have to be a position of greater huh? spiritual evolution. Yeah. 
So then why are all these qualities given? They are indicators, but more importantly, they are given so that we will adjust our relationship with that teacher. Because in our relationship with teacher, there can be uh, a lot of, uh, what do you call it, misunderstandings and also misalignment. Misalignment is a better word. Yeah. That teachers, we, we, we've all chanted, Tomeva Mata, Chapita Tomeva. Tomeva Bandush, Tasaka Tomeva, Tomeva Vidya Dravinam Tomeva, Tomeva Sarvam, Mama Deva Deva. This is the last verse of Guru Stotram in which it says, Tomeva, you are mother, you are father, you are Bandhu, you are all relatives, you are Saka, my friend. Yeah? You are Vidya Dravinam, you are all knowledge, and even oh my, Dravinam means lack of. Wealth. Hmm? Tomeva Sarvam. You are everything. Mama Deva Deva. My God. My Lord. Now, this is what happens in relationship with teacher. Many different aspects can come forth. Many different qualities of the teacher can come forth. Such as a motherly affection. Such as a fatherly discipline. Such as friendliness. Mm -hmm. all these different aspects will be present in the teacher. But it is up to the shishya to never forget that the primary relationship is, also, is always guru. So as friendly as teacher is, don't take the teacher to be your friend. Teacher may be friendly, but don't take teacher to be friend. Teacher may be motherly or fatherly, but don't take teacher to be your parent. Yeah. Teacher may appear to be like your family, but don't take teacher to be family member. Huh? There's a subtlety in this. In our relationships with friends and families, we have got a particular expectation. And there is a high level of expectation upon affection in a particular way in all these relationships. Yeah. And when we look at these relationships, mother, father, friend, relation, huh? We don't look at any of them in such a way that they are there to cleanse us of our ego. We see them in a different way. That a friend should understand me, support me, have fun with me. Yeah. Mother and father, uh, they must provide financially for me. They must be my security net. Uh, they must assist me, relatives should assist me when I have some physical desperation or need. Yeah. These type of expectations will be natural in those relationships. And they're, they're, they're normal in those relationships and they're perfectly fine. You have to manage them. But when we start bringing that into the Guru Shishya, then it kind of corrupts that relationship because the purpose of the guru shishya that's what he's given in that last word what is the purpose shishya nam syat kritar tata the guru's only purpose is to help you go beyond your ego that's it that's what the guru is trying to achieve friends family relatives can have different purposes Sometimes they want to see you wealthy. So your family wants to see you wealthy. Your family wants to see you with good name and good fame in society. Your family might want to see you networked. Yeah? Your friends might want you to join their business. 
Yeah. So to be agreeable. These are all the expectations in worldly relationships. However, Guru has got no interest in any of these things. His is Kritartata. He wants to see you go beyond your ego. And therefore, the method of dealing with the Shishya by the Guru is very different. It may appear to be same on many levels, but every now and then, the Guru will make one decision which you will find somewhat uncomfortable. He will make a decision or a statement or a comment that will make you feel very vulnerable sometimes. It might make you think. It might make you inquire. It might make you probe an aspect of your life which you don't want to look at. Yeah. Because that is his job. A friend may never ask you to really think about something uncomfortable. Because a friend might say, you know what, why make this nice afternoon into something unpleasant? You know, finally, COVID restrictions were lifted. We came to your house and spent time. And then now you start probing me about my relationship with my father and why I have so much tension with my family. Why you ask this question on me? <laughs> or you ask me my financial situation. <laughs> What's happening with it? And, where are my investment properties? Why are you asking this type of question? I'm so unpleasant. This so friends won't ask you difficult questions. Friends won't necessarily probe you and ask you to change uh, uh, harmful habits. But Guru does not have that purpose. His purpose is different. If he sees a self-destructive habit, or if he sees uh, an emotional or mental block in your spiritual development, he may uh, gently guide you towards now having to face that. And the start, it can be gentle guidance. And then after some time, if you're not getting the point, it can be a little bit forceful as well. The purpose is, you are now stuck in your spiritual journey. And the Guru's job is always to keep that journey moving. Other, no one else in the world will have this as their priority in your life. No one else in the world. Not mother, not father, not relatives, not friend. No one else will have uh, their primary interest is to see you overcome your ego. Mm -hmm. Because there'll be various levels of attachment in those other relationships, which then cause a level of hindrance. The only person that can objectively and consistently seek your welfare is one who seeks nothing from you. If a person seeks anything from you, then that which they seek from you, if you stop giving it to them, they may withdraw in their support. Mm -hmm. So if a friend wants friendship, and now you have taken up a bad idea or a bad habit, now this happens a lot with teenagers. With teenagers and youth, obviously, primarily looking for friendship. And so when a friend takes up a bad habit, smoking, yeah, sometimes they're very apprehensive to confront that friend. Because in confronting that friend, what happened? I will lose friendship and this could become very unpleasant. This relationship become very unpleasant, but that may be in the benefit of the friend because now bad habit is formed. But that friend will not extend themselves. They will finally say, oh, leave, leave. That's their thing. They want to do that. And now we have a nice saying, you do you and I'll do me. That's what we say. That, that kind of just absolves us from all interest and care about your life. You do you, I'll do me. And do whatever you want. I don't really care. Yeah. Guru will have to look at that differently. Yeah. And he will not 
uh, be able to tolerate that. But if he sees a self-destructive habit in the shishya, he will then say, in some way, I have to guide you in order to see this. I will give you the strength to face it mm -hmm. and show you the techniques on how to overcome it. So relationship is different. Relationship is different. And therefore, by showing all these different qualities of guru and understanding purpose of the guru, the idea is that we as shishya should be clear in our purpose about approaching that teacher. And when we approach that teacher, we are seeking a person who can help me overcome my ego. Not necessarily going to make you wealthier, not necessarily going to give you greater fame or name in society, not necessarily going to give you more friends. <laughs> because it all depends on whether or not that is going to benefit your ego or not. Huh? If it's working against you and making your ego bigger, then such action will not be encouraged. It will be bad. It will be bad for the shishya. So, shishya nam kritartata. That is the guru karyam. Guru's duty is to see shishya get to mukti. Overcome that ego. That is, that is their main purpose. Okay? So the idea is that now when we approach a teacher, we must approach a teacher understanding this is the purpose of that teacher. Yeah. And don't get caught up or attached or dependent upon secondary factors, such as friendliness, such as you know, some, some sort of family relationship or family support you want from that person. Yeah. You may get friendliness, you may get other things, but that's not the primary purpose. Yeah. It's like when you buy a banana, the banana comes with skin. And the skin can be, you know, depending on the color of the skin, I'm going to say the ripeness also. So it is green banana, then you don't eat it. Then you wait. Now very yellow, yellow, little bit brown. They have hot. It's nice. Yeah. But when you go to eat that banana, you don't eat the skin. You peel the skin and you go for the actual banana inside. Mm -hmm. Same way, Guru may have all these friendliness, um, warm, supportive, all that. But when I am going to meet that guru, I go there because I want spiritual evolution. That is what I want. And I want to take that satsang, which is going to give me spiritual evolution. I want that satsang from that guru. I want that knowledge from that guru. Yeah. But if I end up eating the peel, hmm, then I have missed the whole point. Yeah. And that can happen in, in relation. Guru is a very well-known guru, Prasiddha Guru. Right? Guru there was a very Prasiddha Guru, well-known. But some people, you know, they like to be around him because he's so well-known and it looks good to be in close association with such big popular figures of society. So they will invite to the house, come to the house and tell everyone, look, this person came to my house, this great guru. Or this person came to my daughter's marriage. Oh, very good. But they never attend any satsang. They don't read any books. They don't ask any spiritual questions. It's just like, please come to our house. And then we can tell everyone, take photos, 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 photos. Myriad of photos with them and every member of the family. And now have evidence that I am connected to Mahapurusha. <laughs> Sometimes these things happen. But it's more in our relationship with Guru, we must be clear. Guru is here to help us grow. And not all growth is pleasant, sometimes painful as well, you know. <laughs> no pain, no gain, they say. Therefore, we should not be scared 
it will get told off by guru, corrected by guru. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing this story when I was very um, new to the mission and really helped me a lot. And um, it's a beautiful story about how guru operates. And um, it says, there was once <clears throat> this marble floor. And on this marble floor, there was a beautiful marble statue. As in a museum. And marble statue was magnificent. That so many people every day would come to see the marble statue and its beauty. Yeah. At night, everyone goes home. And the marble statue has a chat with the marble floor. And the marble floor says, you know, I think it's so unfair what happens here every day. Huh? Because I am made out of marble, you are made out of marble. But how do I get treated? Everyone stands on me with their dirty shoes. They walk all over me. Huh? And they drop food on me, drop drinks on me, everything. They just dirt on me. And what do they do? You, they just stay in awe and wonder. They pay money to come and see you. No one is allowed to touch you. You are cleaned every day, kept in beautiful condition. How come you get such high honor and I am treated like rubbish only? And that statue uh, replied back to the floor and said, at the time of our creation, our creator, the sculptor, he also put the chisel to you. But when he put the chisel to you, you screamed in pain. And you said, no, 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 I can't deal with this. And therefore, he stopped sculpting you. But when he put that chisel to me, I bore all that pain. Yeah. And I was ever compliant and obedient that whatever he wanted to chisel away, I let him chisel away. And at the end of this whole process, he had chiseled me into a masterpiece, but he could not touch you. So you remain as you are. And therefore, you are used as a piece on the floor and I am there observed as the masterpiece. Yeah? Same way, I heard this story when I was 19 or 20. It was a very big impact on me. Because then after that, whenever I met with my gurus after that, I was never scared of being corrected or told off or yelled at or anything. Actually, I took it as great privilege. I am being sculpted. I thought, wonderful. I said, I don't want to be the piece of marble on the floor. I want to be the one that <laughs> is the masterpiece. This is the nature of that relationship. Nature of that relationship. Yeah. And at times, we are sculpted and the chisel is put. What comes out at the end of the day, pure masterpiece, pure masterpiece. Mm -hmm. I always think about Puja Guruji like this because our Guru have sculpted him into being huh? such a great disciple that then became head of the mission after him and did such wonderful things with that mission. Huh? Just expanded the mission and still maintained its purpose. So, so amazing. But this is the nature of this relationship. And that's something we should be clear about. And in whatever way we approach that teacher, in that way, you get that reciprocation. Yeah? So when we approach as friend, we get friend back. If we approach as child, we'll get this parent. But really, we should approach as shishya. Then you get guru. Then you get the best. Huh? Otherwise, sometimes we're just satisfied with the banana peel. We look at that banana peel, it's so impressive, but we never eat the actual <laughs> falam inside. And thus, never nourished. Okay.
So that concludes this portion on Guru. Now, little story. The Shishya is now, this, this Sika, I should say, is now going to approach the teacher. So he's telling his friend, he's now going to the ashram. Yeah, and then the friend now is going to ask some questions. So let us have a look at this text. Hmm. Hmm. Here, number nine. Gachasi kutra tvam mitra. Gachasi kutra tvam mitra. Guru meva bigachami. Guru meva bigachami. Kim patishasi tatra tvam. Kim patish. Patishasitatratvam Vedante yat prakashitam Vedante yat prakashitam okay. This is simple. Uh, so here, Sika is going and to the ashram and his friend is asking him, where are you going, my friend? And his answer, Guru meva bigachami. I'm going to see my guru. Then his friend asked him, Kim Patishasi Tatratvam, what are you going to learn there? What will you study there? And he says, Vedante Yat Prakashitam. I will learn Vedanta. Hmm? Okay, he's going to learn Vedanta. Now, question, what is Vedanta? That's a big question. Okay, so then this is the next one. Kimuktam Vada Vedante. Kimuktam Vada Vedante. Naham Jeevo Dukha Mayaha. Naham jivo dukha mayaha katayat tarhiko sitvam katayat tarhiko sitvam atma nitya chidamandaha atma nitya chidamandaha katitam tatra kim anyata katitam tatra kim anyata atma mamaiva sarvatma Atma mamai vasarvatma ko labas tavanyane na ko labas tavanyane na mukta prinam yata sarvan mukta prinam yata sarvan <coughs> okay so he says kimukta vada vedanta his friend is asking tell me what is this vedanta naham jiva dukamaya Vedanta tells you, I am not this individual who is riddled with sorrow. Then who are you? Atma Nitya Chidanandaha. I am the self which is infinite bliss, eternal consciousness. Oh. And what else is there to study? What else will you learn about from this Vedanta? Atma mama eva sarvatma. Myself is the self of all. Okay. Kolabha tavanyanena. What is the gain from this knowledge? What do you benefit? Muktaha prinami atasarvan. I become free. I become free and I am one or I delight in all beings. Yeah. I have love for all beings. Okay, so here in these two verses, we are now seeing the overview of what is Vedanta. So that first verse which we read is just the, the friend asking the question, what is Vedanta? Then now the answer is a nice answer. Naham Jiva Dukkamaya. What a nice response. So what are the topics of Vedanta? One of the main topics of Vedanta is that you are not this individual. You are not the individual. Individual is called Jiva. You are not the Jiva. And what is Jiva? Dukkha Maya. <laughs> Maya means saturated. Dukkha is sorrow. You are not the jiva who is saturated with sorrow. Ayyo. Oh, this is good news. Good news. But Swamiji, I don't even feel like I'm saturated with sorrow now. Even as jiva, I'm quite happy. Life is going on quite nicely. 
I'm I'm an introvert and I'm enjoying COVID lockdown. It's become my paradise. I government has granted me swarga. Huh? If you're introvert, this is a wonderful time to be living. Yeah. So some people will feel hmm, this jiva dukkamaya, I don't agree with. I don't believe that being a jiva is filled with sorrow. Now, on face value, it doesn't appear like that. Because on face value, jiva, individual, he goes through sukham and he goes through dukkham. So there is sukham. He does have happiness. You can't say that his whole life is dukkamaya. How can you say that? And if he's getting sukham, then what's the big deal with being the jiva? Why can't he remain as jiva if he's getting sukham? Why all of a sudden are you saying he must give up jiva to us? Because there's some happiness is there. Yeah. Now there's an interesting investigation. Mm -hmm. Even in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavan says, Anityam asukam lokam imam prapya bhajaswamam. He said, this world, Anityam Asukam, he doesn't have any happiness. Why Anityam? Because it's temporary. Because it's temporary, there's no happiness. He said, therefore, worship me. That's what Bhagavan says in Gita. Okay? Now, similar sen sentiment is coming. Jiva is Dukkamaya. Now, is Jiva really Dukkamaya? Is Jiva filled with sorrow? First of all, what is Jiva? Jiva means individual. According to the BMI chart, the Jiva is consciousness identified with individual vasana, mind, intellect. That's it, not body. Yeah, consciousness identified with individual vasana, mind, intellect. That is called Jiva. Okay. This jiva then moves from birth to death and picks up a different body. From death to death and it gets a different body. So body is not part of jiva complex. Mind, intellect, vasana. This mind, intellect, vasana is what travels with the jiva. That's what defines you as you and me as me. Currently we are defined by jiva twam, our vasana our intellect and our mind. Vasana means our habits, our nature, prakriti, disposition, yeah, characteristics. This habit, characteristics, disposition expresses through the intellect. And then the intellect has a certain texture depending on the vasana. So you've got a lot of tamogun. So in vasana, you can have Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's a lot of Tamogun in your Vasana, then your intellect will be very dull. That means you won't have opinions about anything. You are not thought about much. There's not much insight into anything. Not interested also in learning. Yeah. If the Vasana got a lot of Rajogun, then your intellect will constantly looking for uh, some sort of goal to achieve. Something to do, something to do. What can I do? What can I do? Uh, how to be more productive? How to be more productive? To do more? Gain more? How do I gain more? It would be very interested in gaining things. Yeah. And when it is sattvic, then the intellect becomes quite introverted. It can look within itself. And it becomes very fascinated with the world within. The Rajasik one will be very fascinated with the world outside. Sattvic one will be very fascinated with the world within. And we enjoy the journey within to look. Okay? And then mind will be according to that. So as for your intellect, then your mind will also be fashioned accordingly. Yeah? So there's a lot of Tamogun, mind will constantly be seeking some sort of stimulation. Must do something to stimulate me the whole time. Need some TV, need some huh? entertainment, drugs, drinking, all this type of thing will be required to stimulate the mind. It's dull. 
If it's intellect, rajasic, fascinated outside, then mind will also be reactive, highly reactive, because it keeps reacting to everything that it's seeing outside. So it's so fascinated with things outside, it'll react. I love this, I hate that, as it meets the world. So mind becomes highly reactive. And sattvic, then mind becomes shanta, peaceful. And it looks within, and within is a source of happiness, so it starts seeing a little bit of that happiness, only more shanta manaha. So this complex, consciousness identified with vasana, mind, intellect, this complex is called jiva. Okay, this is what we call, when we say jiva, this is what we're referring to. Let me see if I can find if I have a slide here. Can you look at this? Then if you see here, it will be in my chart you're familiar with, consciousness, with vasana, mind, and intellect. This is called jiva. Okay, this is called jiva. This jiva then picks up a body and goes from one body to the next. The body is not maintained. The body is dropped at the end of that life and a new body is taken up. So the jiva huh, can take up female body. Jiva can take up male body. Jiva can take up animal body. Jiva can take up human body, devata body. It can take up different things. It all depends on the texture of mind, intellect and vasanas. Vasanas is where your sattva, rajas and tamas is taking place. And like I said, Tamasic vasanas, dull intellect. Rajasic vasanas, we have the, uh, what do you call it? Extroverted intellect and highly reactive mind. Sattvic vasana, introverted intellect and peaceful mind. Yeah? That's the thing. So that's called jiva. Now here, text is saying, this jiva is dukkamaya. Has got lots of sorrow. Now, this is a big question. Does the jiva have lots of sorrow? Because we go through joy and sorrow. Yeah. So jiva definitely has joys. We can't deny that after this class, we can have some ice cream. And that will be lots of sukham will come. Huh? You can have some lunch after it. Food. I think in lockdown, food is a big source of joy in lockdown. The most exciting part of our day is eating now. Yeah, we can't meet people, can't do anything. So eating is very interesting. Yeah, so how can you sit there and say sukham? Now, here when we look at sukham, in the field of spirituality, we are in the pursuit of what is called perfect happiness. Perfect happiness. And when we say perfect happiness, it means happiness free of sorrow. That's what it means. Happiness that is free of sorrow. Unadulterated, they use that word. Uncorrupted, uncontaminated happiness. Yeah. Now, what are the sorrows that we have? We have sorrows such as desire, karma. We have sorrows such as krodha. When we say sorrow, that which disturbs my mind is called sorrow. That which agitates the mind is called sorrow. So when desire is there, is mind agitated? Yes, mind is agitated. When anger is there? Yes. Greed is there? Yes. Jealousy is there? Yes. Fear? Yes. All these things agitate the mind. So these are all the contaminants these are all the contaminants. And in worldly life, what happens when we get worldly happiness? We do get happiness, but you get happiness plus this contaminant. So you get happiness, but happiness plus contaminant is there. And this is imperfect happiness. This is adulterated happiness. This is called sukham. It's called sukham. Perfect happiness, Shastra calls ananda. In general, this is the in general, this is the words that is used. It's not always used, but ananda generally means bliss. Sukham 
is connected to vishaya object so happiness from objects vishaya sukham bliss is from atma or brahman brahmananda atmananda bliss of the self bliss of the infinite okay what we crave what we crave is bliss what we settle for is sukha this is what happens in life we crave bliss we settle for sukha it's like if you really pay attention to your body your body craves nutrients but many times we settle for junk food hmm? So uh, oh, you know you really want a nice healthy meal huh all different vegetables you want to see some green huh some green spinach kale you want to also see some orange carrots huh peas corn all the you know, all the different colors huh and very nutritious but you know what happens when you look at it oh so many things to cut so many things to clean so many to put together who has time for all these things so we go to the freezer and we pull out something that's you know frozen treats and then put them in the oven on oh, no, our oven even that's too long microwave only mm, nuclear blast that thing and then uh, eat eat hmm? now we have that and you know we eat it but when we eat it there's a part of us which is dissatisfied to never fully satisfied why processed food is processed food only huh you know i have found that even food when i eat from some places you know supermarkets and all that versus if you get food fresh from green grocer it's a very different feeling actually when you eat it from the green grocer it's very satisfying and other places you get it's just been sitting in storage for nine months that apple you know, how did the apple and then you put it on your table for well, one month nothing happens to it it sits there you wonder how has this organic piece of piece of matter all of a sudden become this game became brahman only it didn't change who trust the brahman my apple became brahman only it must have realized the truth before i did because it doesn't change you know that type of food when you eat no taste there's no taste there's something the rasa is not there niras no ras Huh? essence is not there same way vishaya sukham does not have essence there's no ras then why do we have it it's available it's easy to get that's like why do we have fast food easy to get and available less work is less work that's why we settle for it so we settle for vishaya sukham happiness from object joy from objects because less work and much readily available open pantry cupboard vishaya sukham is there open fridge vishaya sukham is there put tv on vishaya sukham is there it's so easy to get yeah. this atma nanda oh i had to sit and meditate I had to quiet my mind to find conducive environment Uh, tell all the people in the family stop making noise and annoying me. I had to meditate, and it's just a bit harder, a bit harder. But this ananda is what we are inherently craving. Everyone is craving it. Every person, whether tamasic, rajasic, or sattvic, every being, Buddha, animal, uh, dog, all these things are actually. Everyone is craving ananda. the yearning is for ananda but we settle for sukha and what is the nature of sukha contaminated happiness and what is it contaminated with some agitation is there yeah you always find some agitation kama krodha loba bhaya irsha ha huh? desire anger frustration yeah jealousy can be there fear there greed is there so you know sometimes you go to a place huh? like dinner party or someone's house afternoon tea and they put snacks out and the snack is so tasty 
And then as you're eating it, you're looking at how many are left on the plate because you want to have seconds, you know, you want to have seconds, but then you have to keep an eye because the children sometimes run around and keep eating all the food, you know, and some little children don't even eat the food. They just touch all the food and put it back. And then you're like, now what can I do with it as well? I can't even eat this. So while I'm eating this delicious samosa, I'm looking at the next one. Can I get access to the next samosa or spring roll? But now everyone is coming one by one and eating it. So while you're enjoying spring roll, huh, then there can be fear that I can't get more of this. So that happiness has got fear in it. Then some child comes and puts 10 on his plate and walks away. Now you get angry. While you're eating it, you get angry. You say, why did he go and put 10 on his plate? Huh? Then the parent comes and says, good. Tell that child off. But the parent takes five of the ten and puts on his own plate and starts, is it, now what is the chap doing? He's supposed to put it back and he kept it on his plate. So now you have jealousy. You see, because you only got two. He got five. What you don't know is he trained his child to do this. Because he, he was too embarrassed to sit and take five when anyone gets two. So he trained his child before. He said, hey, if the spring rolls are there, you take ten. Put on your plate, I will come and take five from you. And you didn't know he did all that. So now, even while you're eating this spring roll, is there not all this frustration, this anxiety, this, this annoyance, this jealousy, all this is going on? Mm -hmm. I always love it when we give children prasad. When you get your, and the chocolate prasad, oh, they love chocolate prasad. And when you give them chocolate prasad, you know what? They sometimes never look at what they get, they look at what the other child gets. So you put it in their hand and they look at it. But he got smarties. I wanted smarties. I, I want this. I don't want this one. That is happiness with now this envy has come. Because I, I mean, he got better. How come I get that? No, you must take what you get. Yeah. Same way, we get job promotion. We get one promotion. Frank gets double promotion. We can't enjoy our promotion. He got double promotion. Yeah. We buy a new house. He gets better house. Mm. Huh? My child gets B plus, his child gets A plus. Mm. Now, how do I enjoy my child? My child is a C grade person, and now he gets B plus. I should be happy that he's lifted himself, but their child is getting A plus. I can't even enjoy my own child's success. Is this not the type of happiness we get? Yeah. Even just eating food, as we eat tasty food, our guilt is always there. Yeah. They got moment on your lips, lifetime on your hips. Never always remember that mantra. Yeah. <laughs> so that'll keep guilt on you. That's a terrible mantra. Someone told me, a doctor told me. But now you can never enjoy anything. No food you can enjoy when you hear that mantra. I have now contaminated all your happiness. Yeah, with that mantra. <laughs> Should not have said it, but I did. But mm -hmm. This is called adulterated happiness, okay? All this happiness has got a contaminant. This is currently what we are settling for. That's why from Shastra's point of view, when Shastra looks at Jiva, he says Jiva has got contaminated happiness when he could get pure happiness. He can have Ananda, but he's currently eating Hmm. He can have bliss, but he's having this contaminated happiness. Therefore, Shastra looks at this happiness and calls it Dukkha. Shastra says contaminated happiness is Dukkha. Yeah. Just like people who are into all health food, Whenever they see any food, junk, this is junk. Everything is junk. They call everything junk. It could be the healthiest meal you've had the entire week. But because they organically grow everything in their backyard with no pesticides, herbicides, this side, that side, they look at what you have. So even if you're having spinach, but the spinach is from a place where they use pesticides, it's junk. That's junk. Or it's got preservatives, junk. I know one person, they, they look at the number code. 
on the you know the food and they, if the food has got that number in it no nope, i will not eat it it is gone no. i said all the food i eat has got this number code on it i think i don't <laughs> so i think my whole life has been full of junk on me yeah so now from his standpoint when he looks at my food he says everything you eat is junk yeah shastra is looking from the standpoint of bliss and says you can have this bliss and when it looks from the standpoint of bliss, it then looks at the jiva and says, jiva's happiness is also dukkha mode. It is so contaminated that how can you actually be satisfied? You cannot be satisfied. So in this way, jiva dukkha maya. Mm -hmm. Now, as we, again, as we in life become more aware of the contamination of happiness, then our thirst for pure happiness becomes stronger. See, many times, like I said, when we're used to a diet of junk, we're not even aware that it's bad for us. So we're so used to it, we've never even tasted anything fresh. We've never tasted anything that is uh, free of all these chemicals. So we are so used to Vishaya Sukham that we've never even known that Ananda was there. Yeah. Once you get a taste and a glimpse of Ananda, a peace and a bliss, which is free of all this fear, envy, anger, frustration, greed, that, all of them, your eyes open. And then Jiva starts thinking, I refuse to be satisfied with this diet. I want a different diet. I want healthy, healthy diet of pure happiness. I want a diet of Ananda. I'm tired of all these frustrations. I'm tired of all these feeling inadequate. I haven't done enough. I need to do more. Like even in relationships, as much as people show you love, we always feel like oh, I'm not loved enough. I'm not respected enough. As much as children do for you, your spouse does for you, you always feel it's not enough. Mm -hmm. More, more, more. This is all contaminated happiness. So when you become aware of these contaminants, then you start yearning for ananda. Okay, that's why it says, uh, what is Vedanta saying? You are. You don't have to settle for this contaminated happiness. Naham jiva dukkamaya. You can have something better. What can I have? Atma nitya chidananda. You can have bliss. Vedanta says you can have that bliss. You are allowed to eat that. You're allowed to live on that. You can just completely revel in that. You need not settle for this type of petty, paltry happiness. Oh, that sounds good. Huh? So that's one of the gains of Vedanta. It will teach you how to get pure, unadulterated happiness. What is the other thing? What else do you get from Vedanta? Mama Atma Eva Sarvatma. Myself is the self in all. Yeah. Myself is the self in all. This is a very... Um, this commonly comes up, this theme that you will see in Bhagavad Gita. Sarva Bhuta Hiterataha, Sarva Bhuta Atma, Bhuta Atma. Huh? What is the nature of the realized person? One who identifies with the self in all, one who sees the self in all, sees the divinity in all, and is one with that. Sees his self as the self in others. What does this mean? You see, in life, if you see, if you ask most people what's their number one priority in life, most people say their number one priority in life, family. Most people say, yeah. And even if you say, even if you say, no, work actually is more interesting. When you ask people what the difficulties they have at work, it's always to do with people. Management, management. These managers, I don't like them, yeah. Or I've got some staff which is very lazy. They don't do what I tell them to do. Analyze most of our problems in life come back to human relationships. 
because family is all human relationships only. Yeah? And even at work, problems at work are largely connected to human relationships. Yeah? So where is most of our frustration in life? Human relationships only. And why is there so much frustration is because we don't connect with people. We live on a very surface level of our relationships. We see people high by. Even in the family, our relationships become very functional after some time. Have you done this? Have you done that? Who's taking this child for cricket? Who's taking that child for music? Who's unloading the dishwasher? Who's, it's very functional. It's very functional after some time. And so what happens is connection doesn't take place. And connection means, can you get into the very depth and core of that person's heart? Can you understand them and see the world from their standpoint? That's what connection is. Can you see the world from their standpoint? Mm -hmm. I was reading something on empathy. It's, it's talking about empathy here. And in empathy, it says three factors are there. One, you must be able to identify what that person is feeling. Two, you must feel what they are feeling. You should feel what they are feeling. And then three, you must respond appropriately to that fear. If a person can do that, there's a deep level of connection with that person. That's a full empathy. Now, sometimes what happens is we can do number one. Sometimes we can't even do number one, actually, identify what the person is feeling. We have no idea. Uh, sometimes we're like, I thought you were happy the whole time. I had no idea you were miserable. And that person says, from my face, can't you tell that? No, but that face has been there for 20 years. I didn't realize that that was your upset face. I thought that was your happy face. That was the face there on the marriage day as well. I wasn't happy with the arrangement from the start. I never knew that. No one told me. I thought that was the nature of your face. <laughs> and so some people can't even recognize another person's state of mind. So the first thing is understand their state of mind. That's why we had that emotional wheel, you know, you start identifying your own mood and also mood of others. We should learn. Now, some people can identify. They know this person's unhappy. I know they're unhappy, but that's their problem. For some time, we say that's their problem. That means we are not feeling their pain. We identify their pain. We identify their suffering or their feeling, but we don't care for it. We don't feel it. Mm -hmm. That's the second step that you must feel it. But when you feel what they're going through, then you, you start realizing the pain, the pressure that is there on their mind. And when you recognize the pressure that is there on another person's mind, then the next level comes out of you that you will respond in such a way you want to help that person. You want to ease the pain off that person, ease the pressure off their mind, free them from that sorrow. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we find it easier with children. And when we see children, when they're young and all that, we spend a lot of time with them. Then this empathy, and children are very transparent with their emotions. So children don't put masks, young children, like five year olds and all. They don't have masks. As we get older, we put more masks. Yeah? And we're scared to show that we are unhappy because we don't want to displease authority figures. So older children then put a lot of masks on. Teenagers become hard to read. So you think they're happy, but they may be very unhappy. Yeah? Or you think they're unhappy and they're very happy. But also you can't tell because they have no, <laughs> their emotional expression is very limited. <laughs> So they could be very happy with you, but they have a miserable face the whole time. They, they, but they might be very happy. So little children, if you spend time with, this is a very good exercise because they're very transparent. They're very uh, expressive with their emotions. So it's easy, one, to recognize them. Yeah. And then two, because a child is so helpless, it invokes the sense of 
uh, wanting to help them. That compassion comes that you want to help them because they are quite helpless. And it's quite obvious they're helpless because physically they can't do so many things. Yeah, like if you see a little child trying to reach onto the bench to just to grab a piece of food, you can just see the physical struggle that child has in order to get its desired object. But for a fully abled person, able-bodied person, they have desires which they can't achieve. But we can't see their frustration. It's very hard to see their frustration, but they are going through the same frustration that little child is going through in standing on its tippy toes, trying to balance and get the cookie from the plate on the table. But adults are going through the same frustration, but we don't see it. And therefore it does not evoke uh, this response from us. So as we journey deeper into ourselves, as we journey deeper into ourselves, we come to understand how the mind works. I'm using the word the mind. Because everyone's mind is essentially the same. It's the same instrument. The only difference is desires. Some person wants cookie. Some person wants samosa. Some person wants ice cream. But all of us are just struggling to get something which we desire. That's it. That's how the mind is. Mind has a desire, and after that, we are just working to get to that desire. Any obstacle to that desire, is, it creates anger. Yeah? Anyone who can threaten that desire can create fear. Anyone who else got my object of desire, I become jealous of. Everyone experiences the same thing. These are how, this is how the mind works. It's like everyone has a car. The cars all essentially work the same. Yeah? But different brands are there. Honda, Toyota, BMW, Mercedes. Yeah? And two slight differences in upholstery, color size but well, essentially what's under the bonnet is exactly the same it all runs the same way in the same way if you understand your own mind what is under your bonnet you will come to understand what is happening in other people and when you understand one understand two feel because why in your own journey you have felt how painful that is you have felt the pain of embarrassment, the pain of failure, the pain of frustration, and you have gone through such pains, then when you see someone else going through it, you can empathize deeply and you will feel that this must be their pain they're going through. You know? And once you feel that, then the response becomes quite natural. Yeah? Or with Vivek, some discrimination provided you don't bring your own emotions into it you know, your own personal investment and you think purely from the standpoint of the other one then actually response becomes very intuitive it's very clear what to do it's only when we bring our own personal investment in that it becomes proper so appropriate response in vedanta when we attain to this state of enlightenment then this happens spontaneously. That when a person attains enlightenment, because they have gone beyond body, mind, intellect, vasana, right into the depth and core of it, which is atma, and there, it's from there that they see the world, they can empathize and identify with anyone. That's what it means, right? Mamatma Sarvabhutatma. That they can see what it is like to be in your shoes. They understand. They know that. They understand the feeling. They understand the pressure. And they can respond appropriately. You know, the main thing is, when you have such high level of empathy, what goes away from you is raga and dvesha. 
hatred and attachment, they go. This is what you become free of. When you have high level of empathy for anyone, even your enemy, if you really understand the journey of your enemy, you won't have hatred towards that enemy. You, you can have sympathy, you can have empathy, you may even want to support them. Like sometimes we have, like, you know, we have friends who are growing up and things like that. And then someone you're always competing with, you know, because that person was good at the same thing you were good at. And so sometimes there's a bit of a competition and jealousy between the two of you. And you always, sometimes there's a feeling that they are much better than you. And they are sort of arrogantly looking down upon you. And then a feeling can be there. And then when you finally talk to them and sometimes you bond with this person, then that person said, I always considered you to be better. And I always thought that you were much better than me. And that's why I was intimidated by you. And then you say, I was intimidated by you. And both of you living in the same paradigm. And after that, you become very good friends. <laughs> that you go around and intimidate other people. No. <laughs> you become very good friends because you realize, actually, we have so much in common. But at a superficial level, it looks like you are trying to one-up me. And his point of view is that I am trying to one-up him. Because that's a superficial paradigm. But when you get to the heart of it, each one is feeling threatened by the other. And when it is discussed at that level, all of a sudden, hatred for that person goes away. And love for that person actually comes. And this, this is called pure love. This is not attachment. This love is based on the ability to identify with that person intimately. Yeah. And empathize with them at a very deep level. This is a type of love. It is not hugs and kisses and all that type of love. Huh? Is I understand deeply what you are going through. And I feel for it. Yeah. And I'm here to support you on your journey. Yeah. So, this is called mukta. That person becomes free. Free of what? Free of hatred. What is the first quality that is given of the devotee in chapter 12? Advesta sarvabhutana. One who is free of all hatred. That's the number one quality of a devotee. Advesta Sarva Bhutana Maitra Karuna Evacha is friendly towards that person and compassionate. Compassionate is a third part of empathy. Willingness to respond appropriately to the situation. That is compassion. Yeah. So this is the result. Muktaha Primami Atasarvan. He comes to love all beings, but that love is not in the form of, like I said, hugs and all that stuff that love is in the form of identification with all beings so this is what we get out of vedanta so from the study of vedanta i can go from contaminated happiness vishaya sukam to pure happiness ananda i can start uh, overcoming i become free muktaha from all my dvesha hatred frustrations with people. How? Because Mama Atma, Sarva Atma. My Atma is, the, myself is the self of all. And in that, I enjoy love and identification with all beings, all creatures of this universe. That is what you get from Vedanta. A state of absolute peace and perfection. Okay? This is our goal. Okay? So, now, he has explained to his friend what Vedanta is. Huh? And now the next topic that is going to be there, that he is going to meet the Guru and the topic of God will come up. What is God? Who is God? Does God even exist? That's the next topic that is taken up in this Subodh Vedanta.
Okay. That's it. Oh. 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 Purnamadachate, Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, Hari Om Shri Guru Yonamaha, Hari Om.